Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Today I have one that has been highly requested and it is basically all of your non-aeroid plants. I just don't know if I have it in me to do that much of a video today or any time during this pregnancy, but um, I did pull, I think, eight of my, like what I consider to be my weirdo plants, like not your normal looking plants, like, so you'd look at it and think, is that even a plant? Yeah, we've got eight today. I'm gonna give you a little bit of a back, not backstory, but like a little bit of information that I've pulled from the internet on them in terms of like their native habitat and just like little facts. So please don't take anything I say today as like fact, fact. This is just stuff that I have researched on my own. I don't know how credible or how accurate it is, but I just thought I would include that anyway, just to give you a little bit more than just like showing you what it looks like. So we are just gonna start with <laughs> no one other than, or none other than my booby cactus. So this one is the Martillo Cactus Geometrizins Fakuro Curry Uzenboku. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but um, here's the name, or here's the name. Fakuro, Fakuro Curry, Fakuro Curry Uzenboku. So this one is not found in nature. This one is a nursery produced cultivar and it was actually created in Japan. So you're not gonna find these just like out in the wild anywhere. This one was actually uh, cultivated from the Murtillo cactus geometrizins, which is native to Mexico. And I will insert the photo here and you can definitely see the resemblance in them. Um, but obviously it was cultivated to look like little boobies. <laughs> it's described as a columnar cactus, meaning like a column, like a single upright column, but has the ability to branch off like a candlestick cactus. Like, you know those typical cacti you see that have like the two arms and it's kind of like that. So it has the ability to do that, but it is very rare that that happens. Typically you'll just see it as a single stem like this. Because it's a cultivated uh, variety, you cannot grow this from seed. If you grow it from seed, it's gonna revert back to the Murtillo cactus geometrizins, uh, the one that it was, like its original form basically. So the only way to essentially clone it is via cutting. So just keep that in mind. Like if you ever see like cheap booby cactus seeds and you're wanting this, don't expect this because you're likely going to get the Murtillo Cactus Geometrizins, not the Fakuro Curry Uzenboku. Um, you're better off just getting a small cutting. I actually, this thing was actually much larger when I got it. I think I got this from Crystal Star Nursery, who I will link in the description. I actually have a package coming from them soon, which I'm very excited about. But it was like pretty tall, and so I chopped it. I gave the bottom to my friend Jing, and the offshoot grew, and hers is probably bigger than mine now. It's probably like this big. So yeah, it only started growing like at the beginning of this year. And you can see like how different of a color the new growth is. It's like this sea foamy green, whereas the bottom is kind of this like lighter green. I wish it was a little thicker, but I don't know if it's this thin because it's not getting a ton of light. It is living down here on my living room shelf right under a 10 watt Barina bar, but I just don't think that it's strong enough for this cactus. So I'll probably move this once it's like full blown summer here and I've got like full sun coming through my south facing window. Um, I think I'm just gonna stick it in the windowsill and hope that I can get some uh, vertical height and some some girth. We want some girth on this thing. But I love this cactus so much. I used to have a lot more cactus or cacti Back in 2022, I went through this like anti-aeroid phase. All I wanted were euphorbia and succulents and cacti and weirdo arid plants. Over time, I kind of realized that I didn't have the best place for them to grow. And I kind of, I kind of lost, I'm not gonna lie, I kind of lost interest a bit just because of how 
slow growing or like non growing especially the cacti were and they would kind of just sit there and I just don't think that's my jam I feel like I collect plants to see the transformation to look forward to the growth but this is an exception I just I love looking at this thing it's so interesting I do have a penis cactus but some of you guys might know that I recently beheaded it so it's just like this stump it looks like a chopped zucchini now so i didn't include it in this video because it doesn't really look like much but if it looked the way it looked before then yes i definitely would have included it in this video but um she's doing good i have to remember to like tell you guys about the substrates that i'm using it's just growing in this little clay pot in like sort of a sandy succulent soil mix I don't know if I'm gonna need to up pot it anytime soon just because it's still quite small I would almost guarantee that the root system is really tiny So she can probably live in this little thing probably for another year and then next year I will go ahead and upsize the pot by the way if you're wondering what is in my like succulent mix It's essentially the same as my aeroid mix, but I add more pumice and sometimes sand the next one is the What's today? Eighth. Did I pay my credit card bill? I think I should probably check that. I'm like, when's the last time I paid rent? The next one is one of my favorites. This one is the Dicaria madigariensis, AKA the zigzag plant. And this used to be a lot bigger. I used to have two plants. I got it for my birthday from my best plant friends and um, yeah it got a really bad case of spider mites and it just started to tank and like shrivel up and I really thought I was gonna lose the whole thing luckily I was able to salvage this it was literally just this little piece here that I salvaged and then it grew all of this this year and then this down here so I'm just happy to see it alive um, hopefully I can keep the growth going because I would be so freaking sad if I lost this for good I am tempted to I think that they got this also from Crystal Star Nursery so I might reach out to them and see if they have any more kicking around somewhere in their greenhouse that I'm able to buy from them because I'd love to have a nice big one again <clears throat> a nice big one again and I swear I will be I will be better this time and I will do more spider mite sprays and it's just so weird because it's like what even are the spider mites what what do you want from it it's basically a stick anyway um so this is native to Madagascar hence the name Madag Madagariensis it's named after a French botanist Raymond Dakari who did research in Madagascar and he collected for the National Museum of Natural History France so that's quite interesting and this is actually considered a succulent or it's categorized as a succulent I wish I had more to show you um, maybe I'll throw in some better photos of the Dicaria madagariensis um, as an indoor plant these are just so stunning I think that they make like the perfect sort of isolated statement decorative piece in a house like you could just have it on a shelf on its own styled with other things this is not a plant that i would really like mix in with other plants if you really want to showcase like how pretty it is right now i do have it mixed in with other plants just because it's looking really sad right now it's just living down here same place as my booby cactus but these have the ability to become humongous humongous trees now once it's a tree and very very bushy i don't i don't actually really like it i feel like it gets lost in the sauce a little bit and when it's all compacted together you can't really appreciate how cool and interesting each stem is um, so i much prefer it as not like a bonsai plant but like as a smaller sort of manicured plant like trimming off parts that are too clustered even some of the plants that people have. I'm not going to include any photos because I, I don't want to be mean, but you know, I've seen people who have it as an indoor ornamental plant that it's just so big that it's, it's almost a bit overwhelming. I definitely prefer the Madagariensis to be 
on the smaller side and have more sparse stems if that makes any sense just so you can see like the shape of it more and you can see like the angles of the stems a bit more the branches a bit more so i feel like we're off to an okay start if i can get this guy to just wake up and keep going get this guy to keep going but i am gonna try and snag another one if i can the next one is actually Can you guys hear the wind? It's so windy and spooky and scary. Okay, the next one is actually a new plant that I acquired from my friend Jesse, my sweet friend Jesse, and I'm really, really hoping that I'm getting this ID right or else we're just gonna be spending the next five minutes talking about the wrong plant. I was calling this my pine cone guy but I believe the idea of it is the Euphorbia guentheri, aka a sausage spurge, which is so silly and funny. But to me, it looks like, like a pine cone, doesn't it? This one is actually native to Southeast Kenya. I actually really love a lot of the arid desert plants that come out of Africa. Like I wanna go there just not even to see the animals, but to see the plants. I feel like a lot of people wanna to go to Ecuador and things like that, and sure, that would be great to go to Ecuador to you know, see plants in, it, in its native habitat, but I really wanna just see like the arid plants in, in Africa. Anywho, it is described as a stout perennial succulent. Stout meaning strong slash firm, and then perennial meaning it's like a non-annual, non-annual plant, meaning it doesn't like, like, come alive during the spring and then it dies back during the winter or something like that and i'm being very specific with these terms just in case there's any new people in the hobby i don't want to just assume everybody kind of knows what these term means so yes it is a stout perennial perennial succulent with cylindrical stems so cylindrical cylindrical stem and a spine spine tipped tube tubercles and we're talking about my finger. I need to tell you about my finger. Um, these are what they're talking about, the spine tip tubercles, meaning like an area that sort of like bulges. If you wanna know why my hand looks the way it does, please watch the video that went up on Wednesday. I go in full <laughs> detail about what happened. That is the description of this plant. And as you can see, it does have little leaf lits, little leaves up at the top and it just looks so funny it just looks so silly i don't know i don't know what to make of this plant but all i know is that my friend jesse knows me very well and knows that i just love the weirdo guys and this one's no exception i received it as a cutting so there were no roots but the fact that i can hold it up like this i do think we might have some root action now which is great and it's a good sign that i can see um, some leaves coming in so she's alive and she's kicking she hasn't like really declined at all since I brought it home which is great but really other than that I have nothing else to say about this one because I I don't know much about it I haven't had it for a very long time but I think that it's just so silly and funny. I do think that this is one that I'm probably honestly I think over the summer since Archie <coughs> won't be very he's not going to be mobile at all during the summer he you know he's going to be born in june hopefully um, if he doesn't come early but i should be able to put all of my like cacti and euphorbia and succulents in the south facing windowsill just so that they can get like the maximum amount of sun um i'm having a braxton hicks contraction you guys i've had and i'm gonna i'm knocking on wood because it's a little too early but i've been having signs of labor and i want to say that i'm gonna make it to my due date but there's a part of me that thinks he's gonna come early so i'm literally packing a hospital bag this week but i've been having braxton hicks contractions like constantly throughout the day for the past week so anyway um yeah that is the euphorbia guentheri hopefully i got that idea i Hopefully I got that ID right and I didn't just blab about the wrong plant. 
But if I did get it wrong, please feel free to chime in the comments and uh, correct me. Um, by the way, I'm going to insert some links, maybe like a link or two of some of the websites where I got this information from in case you're curious, want to read yourself because there's like a lot more information that I'm omitting. And if you have any succulents that you want information on, I really like this website. So uh, yeah, give that a give that a look at. Give that a look at? Give that a look-see? Okay. Oh, you're over here. So this one is my Euphorbia globosa. I think of all of the plants I'm showing you today, I've had this one the longest. And I acquired it as just these little balls. Like they were just tiny little balls in a two inch pot. I didn't really know what to expect. And here we are a few years later and I still don't know what to expect. But anyway, um, this plant is native to the arid regions of South Africa. It is described as a dwarf spineless succulent made of globular segmented fingers off of a caudiciform base. So if you don't know what um, a caudiciform or caudex plant is, it's ba basically a plant that forms off of like a fat like base or trunk and the caudex can be like round slash cylindrical or like flat. Since owning this plant, I've always wondered if I was growing it right because this just seems kind of weird. Like I didn't know if maybe this was like a floor crawler like it just crawled the grounds and then like formed more balls because I liked this plant for the little tiny balls and I thought that the way that this plant grew is like it just grew more balls and like balls would just be stacked up like a mountain but to my surprise it yes formed these what did they say globular segmented fingers I'd say that's pretty accurate <laughs> globular segmented fingers she is a weirdo but i i don't i don't know if i love this plant honestly i think i've kept it around because i've had it for so long but this is probably one that i'm going to maybe get rid of soon uh it's been cool to own it while i've had it but i'm just not quite sure it's for me but i definitely wanted to include it because she is a weirdo and uh I feel like we couldn't have done this video without her because she is very, very, very strange. And I know there's a lot of people out there that love the weirdo plants and this would totally tickle their fancy, but it's just not, I don't look at this plant and think, I love it so much. Um, also, you might've noticed this little sausage. I don't know if this was made, this sausage was made by Alice or if it was made by her boyfriend. But either way, they, they have been friends. So yeah, if you have been looking for one of these in your local, I probably will be selling it soon or I might just like separate it out and sell it in a live sale or something. It's just, yeah, not really for me. I, I wanted to collect more trailing plants this year. So I think if I got rid of this one, then I'd feel better about bringing another one home but yeah that's really all i have to say about this weirdo guy and like the euphorbia globosa we could not do a weirdo plant video without my one of my all-time favorite plants the cissus quadrangularis this has been just such an amazing amazing addition to my plant collection since i brought her home i knew she was special the second i laid eyes on her and um like the tortum, this is one that I feel like I'm constantly pushing on people whether they like it or not. Anyone who comes into my house, I'm like, do you want a cutting of this plant? She's really easy. You're gonna love her, I swear. <laughs> so anyway, I'm not 100% sure about this, but per the internet, it says that this is native to tropical Africa and Madagascar, Arabia, India, Sri Lanka, Malaysia, and the Philippines. And um, this is actually another, so perennial, it's a perennial succulent of the grape family, and that is the Vitace, Vitaceae family. The word cissus is from the Greek word ki, ki, kis, kisos, kisos, meaning ivy, and then quadrangularis, obviously, um, you know, four-angled, meaning four-angled. 
And then it's also called the Velt Grape, the Winged Tree Vine, or an Adamant Creeper. Um, it's described as having quadrangular section branches with leathery edges on its angles. And I would say that's pretty, that's pretty accurate. It's a very stiff, stiff plant. The edges are very like stiff and I'm not sure if I would say leathery as the word to describe it. Uh, yeah, leathery is not, that would not be my go-to, but it is very stiff, very firm, very sharp. It has trilobed leaves, so let me show you. Luckily, this one has a lot of leaves right now. So it has trilobed leaves with a tendril on the opposite side of the node. Um, I don't think I have any tendrils right now. They tend to dry off really fast, like much faster than the leaves. Yeah, I'm not seeing any tendrils right now, but typically you'll see when there's a leaf here on one side, you'll notice like a little swirly tendril on the, the other side of it. It produces white, yellow, or green flowers, and the berries are red when ripe. And this is a climber, actually. And I knew it was a climber when I first brought it home and I researched it, but like I looked at it and was like, this is not a plant that I would enjoy out that I would enjoy as a climber. I was like, I'm gonna see if it'll trail. And it's not described as like a very prolific climber. So I thought, and I was looking at photos of it like in its like native habitat. And it's like, yeah, some are climbing, but some are trailing. So I was like, let's just have the whole thing trail. And that's what we're doing. And I have no regrets. I think it looks great as a trailing plant. I love the shape of it. I love how wild it is. And it has sort of a mind of its own. Um, when the new growth comes out, it does come like it goes upward. But then as it gets heavier, it, it falls. So if you're wondering why there's some upright ones and you're wondering how I get it to trail, you just let them get long enough to kind of fall. Um, and then something really interesting that I didn't know about this plant and I only found out when I was prepping for this video is that it has medicinal properties in Ayurvedic medicine to heal broken bones and injured ligaments and tendons. And when I was like trying to find information on this is quadrangularis, it was like the first thing that came up on Google were, were all these supplements and pills, like this is quadrangularis pills, which I was like, what? What is happening? What is going on? So yeah, I guess it has medicinal properties. So a few questions that I've gotten about this is quadrangularis. I was actually gonna do, and I might still do it, like a dedicated this is quadrangularis care video because um, some people have told me that they struggle growing this plant, which kind of confuses me a little bit just because I've really never had difficulty growing this plant, but I'm just gonna quickly go through a few questions. So the first one is what is my preferred medium for the cissus and it's definitely soil. I feel like this plant has done so well in soil. I did have it in pond for a bit too, but I feel like the the growth has been way more vigorous in soil. And I'm just it I, in my soil mix, you can see it in my reference video which I will link in the description. Um, I've always had this thing growing in no drainage. I wouldn't say that it's a particularly like thirsty plant. Like I've really never seen this kind of like shrivel up and um, look very dehydrated, but the vessel does dry out pretty fast. So I know it's taking in a lot of water. These are like really like meaty so i know that a lot of water can like go into these long thingies what do you even call these what are they called branches yeah quadrangular these branches so that is the first question the second question is does your cissus have little tiny brown and white bugs on it so i wish that i had like a good photo to show you of when it was like really prominent I'm not seeing any right now. If you own this plant, you'll know that sometimes it produces these almost like gritty sand-like particles. It almost looks like mineral salt 
and like sand. That's what it looks like. And you'll see it sort of accumulate along the sides of these angles of along the sides of these angles. Um, and it just, yeah, it feels very gritty. And the first time I ever saw it, I thought that they were bugs, but they're not. I don't know what exactly it is, but I've never seen any like harm come from it. And you'll also see that, and I don't think I have any on the leaves right now, but you'll also see it like form on the back sides of the leaves. Right now you can see sort of that salt buildup that I was talking about and they're like little balls. Oh, I thought it was gonna stick to my finger. Um, and so that to me is normal of this. This is quadrangularis. I just kind of give it a spray down if it gets really excessive, but for the most part, I don't really let it bother me because the plant has always been very healthy. So just keep that in mind. If you ever see those, don't freak out. I don't believe it to be pests. I've never seen them move around or anything. And then the last question I got, oh no, the second to last question was, what is my favorite way to propagate Cissus quadrangularis? And my the fastest way that I found is water or perlite. But if I had to choose one, I would say water. Just make sure that you callus it pretty well. Like if you take cuttings at the knuckles here, um, let it callus for at least a couple hours, and then you can stick it in water. I would not recommend propagating just a single little arm like this. It can be done. I've done it recently, but it takes so much longer. I would prefer to do like three at a time or at the very minimum two. And then, yeah, you can also do perlite, but if you do perlite, I would recommend putting it in some sort of like enclosed box because it's gonna dry out really fast. And then, whew, sorry, I'm just like constantly out of breath. The child is up here now. The last question that I got is how do you prevent the leaves from falling off? Like I can't keep the leaves on. And honestly, I just find it to be one of those things that is normal for this. This is quadrangularis. Um, it is a perennial plant, but the leaves are not gonna stay forever. Like I find that they stay for maybe like two to three weeks max. Three weeks is like pretty rare, but the leaves usually last about two weeks for me until they dry up and they fall off. But I don't buy this plant for the leaves. I buy it for for this, the little, why do I keep forgetting what it's called, branches? I keep them for the branches. Having new leaf growth, new tendril growth, it's a sign of a healthy plant. So it's a good sign that you know your plant is healthy, but I wouldn't be too worried if they start browning off and falling off because to in my experience, they're just not a part of the plant that lasts very long. Otherwise, I think when I was reading online, it said that like this plant can't survive if it's not under like full sun, which is not super true. I am growing it right out here. Maybe it's not growing as vigorously as it could be under full sun, but it's growing just fine for me. And it's not even directly under the Barina lights. It's really just getting whatever light is coming through the windows. And during the fall and winter, it's very, very diffused. I never really have any direct light on here in the winter. So yeah, and she's been doing just fine. That is the Cissus quadrangularis. I probably could do a dedicated video on it. So if you, if that's something that you guys would want, just let me know. Okay, one, two, three. We've got three left. So the next one is another favorite around here. I also, no, this one was not from Crystal Star Nursery. This one was from Sarah Levois. My friend Alice purchased it for me when she was traveling there for work. And I am just so, I'm still so smitten that she's in my house. <sighs> I dropped a leaf. That's like a death sentence for a pregnant woman. Oh God. Okay, let me just like pick off some of these like dry leaves before they fall onto this rug. And I just vacuumed, so I don't want to have to vacuum again. So here is my Euphorbia balsamifera, my little miniature indoor tree that I love so freaking much. 
So a little um, information on it. It is native to the Canary Islands, Western Morocco and, West, and Western Sahara, but I think that it is most prevalent in the Canary Islands. In the Canary Islands, they grow in rocky places with very sandy substrate. So you'll see them like, you know, on like mountain sides that have that are just like made of rocks and stuff, but it can live in soil. We'll get to that. Um, it's described as a dichotomous branched rounded shrub. Dichotomous means that it like branches off into two, like, um, where is it good? Like, I guess if you take this for example, this one, like how it just sort of like branches off, I guess. When I first got this plant, it was just, it was probably about this tall and it was just sticking straight up. And all of the photos that I've seen of it are very like curvy and has such like a cool shape, so much character. And I, I wasn't sure if that was something that just happened over time because it was it was kind of like a large plant, I would say by then. But over the years, it has definitely taken a form of its own as it's moved to different locations and it sort of reaches for light in, in um, different areas. And so now she has like starting to take more of an interesting shape. And I don't know how to propagate this thing. I actually didn't check to see how it could be propagated, but I almost feel like it's too bushy. I feel like I'd like it more if it was like a little bit pruned back, like see how that looks. Like I feel like I can appreciate it more for that rather than it being so big. So um, right now I'm just kind of letting it ride because I did repot this recently and I can see she's taken well to her new pants because I see lots of root action down at the bottom. So even though like in the Canary Islands, they, it basically grows in rocks and sand, it can grow in soil and I actually prefer to grow it in soil because I had it in a really like arid, dry, sandy mix before and oh my gosh, it dried out so fast. And you'll notice with this plant, if it goes dry even once, all of these leaves will fall off. I've said this in other videos, but the leaves dying off and going yellow isn't a sign, is not a sign that your plant is dying. It's kind of, I mean, this is a perennial plant, but I would consider the leaves to be, how would I describe that? It's not like these leaves where they stay for like months or years. Um, these ones definitely have a shorter life cycle and it's shortened even more if it is deprived of nutrients and wa nutrients, water and light. So my suggestion if you're growing the Euphorbia balsamifera is to grow it in no drainage because it is a very, very thirsty plant. It uses the water very fast and if you have it in a smaller vessel you will not be able to keep the leaves on here even if it has a smaller root system i would still go with a pot size that's a bit bigger just so that the water retention or the water levels in your vessel is higher than the amount of roots that the plant has so these leaves have been on here ever since the repot and going into a bigger vessel and me being able to keep it hydrated keep it hydrated for longer. Um, this is probably the longest that I've kept a round of leaves on it. So this has probably been on the plant for a solid month now. Whereas before, when it was living in a smaller vessel, it was probably like two weeks was like the cycle. It would like grow new leaves. After two weeks, they'd all fall off, come back again, fall off. So in that sense, I wouldn't put this somewhere in like a high traffic area. Like if it was here, there would probably be leaves all over the floor here, like constantly. So I try and keep this in a place where I can easily just vacuum up dead leaves or just like sweep it up. Right now I have this living on my south facing windowsill. I was hoping that we'd have more sun um, by now, but we're not quite there yet. 
but uh, this is one that I just wanted to enjoy out here in the living room. It's pretty much outgrown every spot that I've put it so far. It was in my plant room and it's hitting the top of the shelf now. So I was like, you know what? I think that she just needs to go out, ride it out and, um, or ride out the wet rest of whatever this overcast season is. Um, but she's doing okay. I would say the most important thing for this guy is um, not even warmth, but water and light to keep it healthy, keep the, you know, the growth going. And I do think that I'll probably prune this thing back in a video in a few weeks just to kind of see if it can be propagated via stem. I don't see why it wouldn't be able to be propagated via stem, but yeah, I just kind of think it's time to manicure it. I am just a little scared though because manicuring and shaping plants like this is not my forte. I tend to go a little heavy. I don't quite have like that vision for it. Um, so I am nervous and I just don't wanna do anything that I'm gonna regret. So I've been pushing it off for um, quite some time, but I think we're getting close to needing to give her a little haircut. And it would be cool to propagate this thing and be able to share a few cuttings and stuff like that. So anywho, that is the Euphorbia Baltimifera. If you're looking for a cool Euphorbia or just a cool plant to add to your collection that doesn't, that isn't an aeroid and that has kind of a more, I'm gonna say ruly, cause it's not like this thing is like such a fast grower. It's taken quite some time to get to this size. Uh, not like succulents where succulents grow out of control so fast. Uh, I would definitely recommend this one. I wasn't sure if this would be considered a weirdo plant, but the more I look at it, I'm like, yeah, you're freaking weird. You are weird. You should have seen my husband's reaction the first time he ever noticed one of these feet. He was like, oh my God, what is, like, what is that? Like he was so freaked out by it because the it wasn't this long before. It's like now starting to kind of wrap around this pot, which was, my vision and my goal for this plant. Also fun fact, I love pruning this. It has like, I don't know, it just like plucks out so nicely and it has like, I don't know, it just feels so good to pluck out. It's so satisfying. I love trimming this thing back and manicuring it. I can't remember when I got this. I, I definitely got it last year and this was like my last ditch effort at trying to grow, grow a fern. I was like, you know what? I'm gonna try one more time because um, I've tried growing uh, like a variety of ferns in the past and it just like all ended up the same where it just ended up drying up, all the tips were going crispy. But I had heard that this one was a lot easier. Um, if you look up the care for this fern, some websites are gonna say it needs high humidity. Some are gonna say this is the most forgiving fern and I definitely have my own opinion on it. So anywho, this is the Devalia Fijin, Devalia Fijinsis, AKA the rabbit's foot fern. It is native to Fiji, and I think that's where the, the name Fijinsis comes from. In its native habitat, it is epiphytic, uh, meaning it grows like on the sides of trees, on the sides of like mountainsides and stuff not in the ground, but it can be planted in soil, obviously, as an ornamental house plant, and it does totally fine. Defining feature of it, hence the name rabbit's foot fern, are these furry rhizomes, and this is where the new fronds grow out of. Like, you can see some of the new growth out of there. I'm gonna say, just based on my personal experience, having owned many different types of ferns and failing in Canada, living in Canada. This is by far the easiest fern I have ever owned. The most low maintenance fern I've ever owned. And this is actually sitting on a shelf that is right next to my baseboard heaters. And during the winter, we had that baseboard heater going all day, all night, and it just continued to grow. Like this is much bigger than when I first got the plant. And I think I might have repotted this on camera, but these rhizomes were definitely not creeping out like this yet. And it's just, yeah, continued to grow so much. So I just can't wait till this whole thing is just like covered. I know a lot of people are gonna be freaked out by it, but I just think it's the coolest thing ever. Propagating it, you can propagate it via division 
or um, root slash rhizome cutting. So like if I cut like one of these off, I could propagate it that way, but it also reproduces via spore. I have never seen any spores on mine, probably because I'm not keeping it in its like ideal environment. Hopefully, maybe I can find a photo of a spore on this plant. Um, hopefully it doesn't trigger some of your trypophobias. But yeah, that is how it reproduces. In terms of how it is described, it's described as the fronds being multi-pinnate, meaning it has leaflets on either side of the stem. So this is the stem and it has leaflets on either side um, in pairs opposite of each other. So basically having leaflets on both sides of the stems and then the shape of the leaves itself. Uh, like I'll just take this guy for example. It's described as ovate, meaning oval. So like oval or deltoid, meaning like triangular. I don't know if I have any ovate ones. I feel like all of my leaves on here are triangular. Anyway, um, those are the little fun facts about this one. So I have mine growing in no drainage. Lekka down at the bottom. A, I opted for a denser soil mix just because I found that all the ferns growing in nurseries and greenhouses, when you bring them home, it's just so dense. It's so dense, but it's typically potted in some kind of peat-based soil and peat dries out a lot faster. But I did mix it with perlite. I mixed it with a good amount of worm castings. I don't think I have any fir bark in here, but yeah, it's just a pretty, a pretty dense mix. And I've got rhizomes growing inside it's fine I'm, i don't want to pull it out um but i don't spray this thing i don't really give it any showers i don't do anything special to it i literally just keep it on my shelf and i water it once or twice a week this one can tolerate sitting in a little bit of water i haven't noticed any declining of the plant with having more water down at the bottom uh, you will notice a little bit of browning sometimes if it's like uh, if it dries out But honestly like this is all I haven't pruned this thing in forever And this is all that I have in terms of the stuff that's dried out. So if you Are like me and you love ferns, but you are unable to Keep them because you're constantly victimized by them Please give the rabbit's foot fern a go. This one is just not like her pals. I'm not sure why like people give the advice online that it's this high humidity, high maintenance plant because that is just not my experience at all and I feel like I'm just like an okay plant parent and I also know nothing about ferns and the fact that this thing is still alive and growing like crazy I think is more so a testament to the resilience of the plant rather than anything that I'm doing. So highly, highly recommend this one. I'm so glad that I finally found a fern that I can keep because whenever I go to nurseries, I always admire the fern selections. Like I feel like the maidenhair fern is so, so beautiful. Um, there's that other fern that's very like whimsical. It's so dainty. Like the leaflets are like little tiny hairs. Can't remember what it is, but hopefully I can find a picture and plug it in. I love that plant too. Um, my friend Pearl, she grows that plant like a hot dang and she just, she doesn't spray or anything. She just swears by growing it in no drainage. Pearl is another one of my friends that have been growing in no drainage for years, even before we became friends. That's just her way because she doesn't like having to deal with plants drying out. She wants to just water it, leave it and not think about it. Um, so yeah, anyway, glad to finally have a fern in my house that won't croak on me because yeah, I've had it for an, enough time now that I feel confident in, um, in saying that I think she's gonna make it. I think she's, she's on the road to becoming much more bushy and lush than she already is. Please ignore the noise in the background, but I gotta get going here. So this is one that I got from my friend Amanda, AKA Bunny last year. This is an Amorphophallus operculatus. The first Amorphophallus that I really wanted was the Amorphophallus atroviridis, which I will include here. Sorry if I'm saying that wrong. And I 
I don't know if I would still want it, maybe, but I think after having this one, like my Amorphophallus tickle is tickled. But basically, the Amorphophallus is native to Asia, Africa, and Australia, but the Operculatus specifically apparently can be found in Thailand. Amorphous is Greek for without form slash, slash misshapen, which... I mean, I guess that's pretty accurate. And then phallos is Greek for penis, which refers to the shape of the spadix, which I will throw in a photo here. You guys might be familiar with this and didn't even know that it was an amorphophallus, but it has the largest inflorescence of any plant in the genus. And it's also called the corpse flower because of the bad smell it produces when it flowers. And like these inflorescences, you guys, are dinosaur level big like if a dinosaur was gonna pick a flower to give to its partner like this would be the perfect one because it would be the right size i think it could take up to like six years or something for it to flower and so when it's about to flower it's like a huge thing like if a conservatory has um, a corpse flower they'll like announce that it's gonna flower and people come and they they watch it flower some um, conservatories will have live stream cameras so that people can like watch online for when it's gonna flower but yeah they call it the corpse flower because apparently the smell is just so so awful i have no idea what it smells like if you've ever smelled the corpse flower i'd love to know what you thought it smelled like just out of curiosity and then the last little fact about it is that it is a tuberous plant so it grows from like a little um bulby looking thing looks like a potato so yeah this plant is pretty cool it has like a very interesting leaf texture to it it's definitely more it's definitely more velvety, I would say, than like an anthurium or a philodendron. And it has sort of like this like silky, velvety feeling to it. Um, it doesn't look that great right now because it's in a mixture of tree fern fiber and moss, but I just, it dries out so fast. And this is one that dried out when I was in California. Not vintage fault at all, it's just, you know, it happens. So uh, yeah, it used to look a lot more vibrant and dark, but it started to kind of yellow and crisp up at the tips. But before that, this one was actually pretty easy. Like I kind of assumed that they this would be a really hard plant to grow, but it's been actually so much easier than I thought. One thing I will say is that the stems are like a million miles long, so I don't really know how to tame it other than putting it on a pole. But it does have really cool leaves and I enjoy watching a new leaf unfurl. I'm going to, if I can find a photo of an unfurling leaf, it looks really, really cool. It kind of is reminiscent of like a tortum almost where the fingers are kind of like wrapped in itself. My mom is the one that brought this from me, brought this to me from California when Amanda sent it and it uh, grew in her prop box and she freaked out. She thought it was like some kind of spider or some kind of like insect or something, but it was just an emergent leaf. But yeah, I don't really have much else to say about it other than it's a cute slash cool plant and it's not that hard to grow. So anyways, I think this is where I leave you guys. Um, Hopefully you got some useful information out of this or maybe found some weirdo plants that you want to add to your collection. If there are any weird if there are any weirdo plants that I should put on my radar, please leave them in the comments. Um, but I feel like you guys are pretty good about that. Sometimes you guys will like comment or even like just message me and be like, hey, have you heard of this plant? Like I feel like this is something you'd really like. So thank you guys for hanging out with me for another upload. Thank you for being here. If you liked it, please don't forget to give it please what wait what if you liked it please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and i'll see you in the next one